Well, I apologize for starting uh, five minutes late, but here we go. People will continue to stream in, and um, we have a lot of people who registered to attend this event. And we also uh, have a fairly substantial online audience, we think. So welcome to everyone who is watching this live online and to those who will watch this later streamed off the Hudson website. And we hope there are many of you in that category too. Uh, I'm Charles Davidson, the publisher of The American Interest. And I also run a program at Hudson Institute. And the president of Hudson, Ken Weinstein, was supposed to be here to introduce Hudson Institute. So I will first wear my Hudson cap and welcome you to Hudson Institute. Um, and uh, the American Interest is very grateful that Hudson is lending its space for this event. Um, we published in 2011 the issue on the left, Are Plutocats Drowning Our Republic? And the genesis of this event is on, on the morning after of Brexit. I thought about all the, the wonderful prescience that the American interest has had over the years, which is, of course, underappreciated. And uh, so I called up uh, my... my uh, co-founder and partner in this endeavor, Frank Fukuyama, the morning of Brexit. And I said to him, Frank, it seems to me we were the first on these subjects that we are going to, if you will, retroview today. And Frank said, when I say the first among thought magazines and political publications and whatnot, and seriously talking about the problems of plutocracy and equality and all of this stuff. Um, and Frank said, yeah, I think that's right. And uh, so that was the genesis of this event. And the speakers here, uh, all but one, had pieces in this Our Plutocrats Drowning the Republic issue, which we published in 2011. And then we also have here today Nils Gilman, who has the cover story in the cover to your right, Leviathan Mugged. And uh, you will see that that very much plugs into what we published in 2011. So we are going to uh, start uh, with Tyler Cowan, who has a piece or had a piece in the 2011 issue, which uh, we, of course, urge you to read. And it's very easy to find all of this on the American Interest website for uh, three bucks, at least for a month. And you can cancel after a month, or you can remain a, an online subscriber. And we still, we still sell print. I don't know for how much longer for those of you who are interested in print magazines. So without further ado, thank you again to Hudson Institute, not only for the facilities, but for the extraordinary quality of the audio visual work, which is done uh, by Adam Lowe, who's sitting over there with a somewhat longer beard than a few weeks ago, which I think looks very good, Adam, by the way. And um, Tyler, let's roll. Thank you. If someone had come up to you in 1986 and said that one of our political parties would be pro-Russia and anti-NATO, and that the other one of our political parties would be in bed with Wall Street and also extremely chummy with America's most dynamic economic sector, which now is Silicon Valley. And that furthermore, the first party was the Republicans, and the second, the Democrats, and that the Republicans would still pretend to be right-wing and the Democrats left-wing, you literally <clears throat> would have thought they were insane. And in, in that sense, you would be right, because in some regards, our contemporary world seems to be insane, and we need to at least entertain as a default hypothesis that it is insane, right? So that's what I'm going to talk about today, but at a slightly more global level. A while back, I wrote a blog post with the title something like, What the Hell Has Gone Wrong? So that's really my topic. Uh, what the hell has gone wrong? I have absolutely no solutions, uh, but I'll sort of catalog or talk through some of the features behind a sort of collapse of order going on in some parts of the world. But let me just start with what has gone right, because that's very important. And what has gone right is pretty simple. It's huge. I'm not sure it will prove big enough to counter what has gone wrong. But what has gone right is just most of the world is a lot wealthier than before and also a lot healthier. 
and you probably all know the numbers that you can find them online. But everything I say, I'm not, not, not trying to deny this. I know it's true. I've written a lot about this myself. I am not sure that for the future emotional tenor of our world that will suffice. But it's a huge ace in the hole. It's a big positive. It's working for all of us. And again, maybe North Korea aside, even North Korea seems wealthier. The world is getting much wealthier and healthier. So that's the plus. Now, what's gone wrong? I have about 10 stories I want to tell. Some are simpler than others. Some of these stories you've heard. Let me go through just a few. <clears throat> the first story, this is for nations on the technological frontier. It's the productivity story. So since either 2000 or 1973, depending on your views on the statistics, but rates of productivity growth in US, Western Europe, Japan have slowed down really quite a bit. So in recent years, productivity growth in the US, it might be a half of 1%. In the 1920s and 30s, it was 3%. It's a factor of six. It's a big difference, right? I wrote a book called The Great Stagnation. So people are upset because they're afraid their children will not lead better lives or even equal lives to what they did. And furthermore, within politics, there's less in the way of goodies to pass around to buy off dissent. That may be at least as important for the overall political mood. So that's the productivity story. It's the one I've looked at, I guess, the most closely. And I'm pretty convinced it's true. And I think the more years pass, the more people accept that we've been in a productivity crisis for some while. When Peter Thiel, Michael Mandel, myself, we first, first put this forward, a lot of people said we were crazy. But now, after more years, it's become, I'd say, the mainstream default position. The second story, <clears throat> bit more complicated, more moving pieces. It's what you might call the globalization story, right? We all know our world is more globalized. I think it's over the years 1990 to 2007, like international trade grows at a rate three times of the rate of world GDP growth. That's actually phenomenal. Three times more. So the world's a lot more globalized. And you hear so many different conjectures about this pissing off voters leading to Brexit, support for Trump in the media, those tend to be very sloppy. There's so many different aspects to globalization and what actually is causing what. I've never seen sorted out even the possibilities, much less what is true. But some of the typical stories you hear is the trade with China story and loss of manufacturing jobs, uh, the immigration story, quite distinct. And another one you don't quite hear enough about, I would say the uh, reallocation of capital from wealthier countries to less wealthy countries. Part of that is called outsourcing, but it's actually broader than that. But at different rates and paces and degrees and different places at different points of time, you have the globalization story going on. For me, I think the most important angle of the globalization story is maybe simply that people feel they have lost control. So when things are more foreign, so you're an English person and you walk through London, London feels, and indeed is, central London, especially a kind of foreign city. You don't feel that, quote unquote, your people control London anymore. Is this rational? Is some of it prejudiced? Is some of it racist? From my point of view right now, those aren't the key questions. But the point is, globalization has made a lot of individuals feel less in control. In the United States, there's a well-known fact. I don't remember the exact year, but it's not so far from now when the median American will be, again, definitions here differ, quote unquote, non-white. Again, whatever you think of this, a lot of people don't like it. They may not know that number, but they sense there's something happening where like their people, their values are no longer in control. I'd say the control premium is one of the underrated ideas in economics still. People love to feel in control. They'll pay a lot of money, even waste a lot of money for that feeling. Right now, people do not feel in control. Uh, <clears throat> let me just mention a story that I think is considerably overrated, because I know you hear so much about it. So it's not that high on my list. It is on the list. I think it's one of them, but it's not in my top five, maybe not even my, my top seven. But that's the inequality story, which media are obsessed with. I don't think that's the main thing bothering most people, and certainly not most Americans. Just two or three reasons why. First, I think the inequalities which, which actually bug people are quite local. So it's the people you went to high school with, 
and you look on Facebook and what are they doing? That can really bother you. Your colleague down the hall, did he or she get a bigger raise than I did? So I do think people really care about inequality, but not across such vast distances as say, you know, very poor people looking at Bill Gates and, you know, being very upset that Bill has more money than they do. I don't think that's the main story here. So inequality is local. To me, the inequality story is that these local differences, you know, your wife's sister's husband, how's he doing right now? Uh, they're somehow more salient, maybe because of social media. So I think also if you look at the political science literature, you look at regressions cross-country, increases in inequality actually predict disengagement, not rebellion, not Thermidor. If anything, what predicts in the statistical sense, the correlative sense, uh, rebellions in democracies is economic growth, rising expectations. So the idea, oh, inequality's up, everyone's all pissed off, therefore they're going to take to the streets, well, America, Britain, wherever, you know, have the next Thermidor. For me, that, that's very far from my thinking on this issue. I don't think the numbers or human nature really bear it out. I think in a few countries it's a factor. Uh, South Korea, Singapore, in my opinion, partly because they're much smaller and the capital city matters more. In Singapore, it's all you've got is the capital city. Uh, local and global inequalities, they're much closer together. But anyway, inequality story, I'll downgrade. Another story, I call it the males story. There's something wrong with a lot of men. And I hypothesize some percentage of men, a clear minority, I don't know how many, but they grow up and they want to make trouble and they want to be rowdy and essentially they want to kill and be violent. And this varies a lot by culture. U.S. has this problem more than Denmark does, and yes, that means we've done some things wrong, but it's still the case. And I think our world, almost completely for the better, has become much more feminized and tamer and more peaceful, and that's great. I'm an advocate of you know, people being wimps, in a sense. But I think this group of men, manufacturing jobs, largely gone. There isn't a draft anymore. There are drones. They don't know what to do with themselves. And America as a country, some other places too, you know, northern England, not very good at managing them. So they turn to trouble in some way. Uh, make trouble. So that's going on too. So all these stories, I would say, are, are operating. It's a kind of perfect storm. Productivity story, globalization story, the males story. Another story, I'll call it the Manker Olson story. It's a kind of political stagnation. There's an accumulation of interest groups. It's sometimes called gridlock. I don't think that's exactly the right word. I mean, U.S. has changed some policies. We had big bailouts. We had Obamacare. I wouldn't exactly call it gridlock. But I would just say more and more of the federal budget is spoken for. There's less and less to toss around in debate. So if you look at political rhetoric, there's a great new paper by Jesse Shapiro and Matt Genskow. Starting in the early to mid-90s, political rhetoric becomes way more heated and partisan. Like before the early 90s, if a politician gave a speech in Congress and you would statistically analyze the words in that speech. Get this, most of the time you could not tell if it were a Republican or Democratic congressperson. Shocking from today's point of view. But that changes now today, almost all the time you can tell. Do they call it the estate tax or the death tax, right? Come on, you know who it is. Word analysis tells you most of the time. So it's precisely when there are fewer real decisions to be made and the money that is spent is spent more kind of guaranteeing safety to more people, more different groups, locking everything in, more of a NIMBY mentality, less obsession with going to the moon. Can you believe it? We did that basically in seven years with far inferior technology, with computers way worse you know, than my iPhone, starting more or less from scratch. We put men on the moon in seven years, and now we can't even repair the tap Bridge. We can't even start repairing it, like in 20 years. And then repairing it takes more time. Sometimes we cannot even rename a bridge in seven years today because there are so many veto points. So that too is another factor. You could call it the NIMBY factor, the Manker Olson story, political stagnation. I'd say a bit mischaracterized as gridlock, but all different ways of talking about the same elephant. That's part of our perfect storm. <clears throat> now we're going to get to... Uh, well, before I get to the two scariest parts, let me just give you yet another way of thinking about some of what maybe is happening 
in America and other economically advanced nations. A lot of the productivity growth we've had, of course, has been things like the iPhone, internet, communications. Like no one thinks there's a great stagnation when it comes to tech, right? No one. Huge advances. Fantastic. That's great. It's the other sectors that are the problem. But it's as if information space has raced ahead of our ability to do things in physical space. And that has a lot of big advantages. It helps a lot of people, people who are journalists, political commentators, live in DC, go to talks like this, watch them on YouTube. It's like, wow, phenomenal. But I think in a way what's happening is we have gone too far in that direction and the importance of what is sometimes called meat space, the so-called real world, physical space, actual geography, it's, it's reasserting itself in a bad way because there's a kind of imbalance in the economy. IT has raced ahead so quickly. And you look at communications, you can say or post whatever you want anonymously. You can say quite nasty things. You can harass people. You can put out there polarizing ideas, which may or may not have your name attached to them. And discourse becomes, in some ways, nastier. But in physical space, things are more or less the same. Like the cyberspace version of this conference, totally different from 20 years ago. The physical space version, you're all sitting in chairs, not really different from the chairs I grew up with as a kid. And uh, you have pen and paper in hand. Nothing wrong with that. But again, there's a kind of imbalance. And I think when you have sharply imbalanced growth, it's actually another part of this perfect storm where our information technology seems to favor a kind of polarization or nastiness, maybe only for 5% of the people, 2% of the people, but that 5 2%, whatever it is, can make a lot of trouble. And when combined with the other parts of this perfect storm are probably another part of the story. <clears throat> Okay, so now the, the two most worrying angles to all of this, and these are more the international arena. Uh, the first is what I will call the mean reverting peace story. Let me explain this a bit. There's a very famous book by Steven Pinker saying the world is getting more peaceful all the time. It's a beautifully written book. It's a brilliant book. It's a persuasive book. In my opinion, it's probably also a wrong book. But it's a very well done book, and he has a lot of argument, a lot of data that people dying in violent ways over time is declining. And those numbers are real. I mean, he, he has a lot of persuasive points, but all of the numbers he has, there's another way to read them. And that is to say, well, look at the 20th century. We have these two big outliers, World War I and World War II. Since then, a lot more peace. But it could just be technologies are more destructive. So that does make conflict more rare. But when conflict comes, it's worse each time. So OK, 19th century, at least for Europe, a lot of that was fairly good, reasonably peaceful post-1815. And then peace builds up. And then you get World War I, which is awful. And then you get World War II, which is more awful yet. And those are so awful, people are scared off, just like not everyone wants to buy equities after the financial crisis. So we're in this lull. And we don't know what the right model is. Is the right model the Steven Pinker model? Oh, we're all so wealthy and healthy. You know, we're all such wimps. Society is so feminized. Nothing bad is really going to happen again. Or is the correct model you have these lulls, and in the lulls, more pressure for violence internationally builds up? Well, what's striking is that over the last six years, indices of violent conflict in the world have been rising. You see this most clearly, Syria, Libya, parts of the Middle East. That accounts for a lot of it. And six years of data doesn't prove that things are getting worse. But you have to start worrying when, the last six years, the indices are going against us. And if you study a variety of conflicts, a clear example, I think, is the former Yugoslavia. Once things there started turning bad, there was an internal logic or dynamic where they got worse. Hatreds that people thought had vanished forever came back anew, or maybe they were actually new hatreds with just old tags pinned on them for marketing purposes. So these negative dynamics, they have a kind of force of their own. So one plausible way of, what, of looking at what's happened to our world, we had a long period of relative peace, growing peacefulness. And then things are so peaceful, you just get a small number of rotten apples. One of them, his name starts with a P. Maybe you know who I mean, right? Putin. Uh, and they think, well, things are so peaceful, I can grab and no one will stop me. 
And that's what we've seen. Again, it may be a blip, it may be noise, we might go back to the Steven Pinker trend. But I think there's an alternative scenario where just a small number of rotten apples make some grabs, they end up essentially unopposed, and then that peaceful order breaks down the way it did before World War I, World War II. And there's at least some chance, I'd say b below 50%, but like not trivial, there's a chance we're in another one of those cycles. Small number of bad players making grabs. People in the freer country so wealthy and healthy, I don't want to say they don't give a damn, but it just doesn't feel that urgent. And so when you have, say, some of the key people in Mr. Trump's campaign being apparently agents for Mr. Putin, uh, this is actually not that big a media story. And there's some outrage amongst various intellectuals, but it's barely a story at all. Uh, people, some, you know, when I do some of my podcasts as part of the sequence, it's called Underrated, Overrated. And I ask the people I interview, like, who's underrated, who's overrated? I have a candidate for underrated. This may shock some of you. But I think underrated today is Joe McCarthy. Now, I know McCarthy did a lot of terrible things, unfair, wrecked people's careers, uh, was against principles of free speech. Like, all the bad things said about McCarthy, those are true. I'm not defending any of that. But McCarthy did bring attention to the fact that the notion of foreign agents inside the U.S. government doing evil things is real. He stressed that, and he was right, and we've forgotten it. So I actually think uh, at some point it will be recognized that fear was underrated. It's going to come back. It's probably here already. And the governments, you know, that have the resources to do that are mostly China and Russia. So anyway, we could be in the middle of this mean reverting peace story. You have peace for long enough you start to edge back to violent conflict. We don't know. I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying it really worries me. Second factor, you look at just the world. Just to ask a simple question. Say America, like global hegemon of some sort, right? Uh, what percent of global GDP is the United States? Is that going up or is it going down? It's going down, right? No one disputes that. What percent of global GDP is what you would call non-free nations? Again, I know it's a little tricky. How free is free? Who counts? Uh, but I'd say that's going up by my measures. There, I recognize some ambiguity in, in doing the count. But still, uh, I'll say it's going up, sort of population presence on the global stage. So just you look at, you know, GDP influence, good guys getting smaller, people, I'm not saying they're bad people in those countries, but their governments are more likely to be... Uh, non-free influences on the global stage, that's going up. Just a simple theory that when the less free countries have more resources, the whole world becomes less free. It's not, to me, a terrible theory. I mean, I think you see this in a lot of Latin America. When the Soviet Union went away, so much of Latin America got better pretty quickly because it turned out without the Soviet Union there, I mean, even academia got better. Can you believe that? For a while, not, not anymore, of course, but uh, Marxism kind of went away for a while. Uh, a lot of those civil wars in Latin America really eased up or disappeared. And I think just the actual presence out there of a lot of resources controlled by non-free, non-democratic governments working a kind of indirect influence on the whole world, I think we underrate that channel and right now, that is not really a channel working for us. So, you know, a fear is like, what's the ultimate bubble? Well, at first it was subprime, right? And then it turned out to be the mortgage market more generally. And then it turned out to be equities too. And then it turned out to be the American economy. And then it turned out to be almost everywhere in the West and so on and so on. But my greatest fear is that the ultimate bubble is some kind of working system with the global hegemon. And that is at least dwindling, and it may be disappearing. So when you turn on the Republican convention and see various claims tossed out, like, oh, we're not going to defend the Baltics, I mean, you might even agree with that position. I'm not trying to argue the substance here. But just to casually announce, A, I'm a great bargainer, and B, our ally to whom we have a written treaty guarantee, we're going to let, you know, hang loose as a starting point for negotiations, Getting back to my opening point, there's something insane going on there. So, uh, I mean, that's my view of the perfect storm. All of these factors, the last two are foreign. The mean reverting peace story and relative proportion of GDP in non-free nations. Those are global. 
very worrisome. And then at home, there's like the Manker Olson political gridlock story. There's the males can make trouble story, the globalization story, productivity story. Some are all small, much smaller for the inequality story. And then on top of that, I just fear the notion of contagion. So when you see similar types of events happen in a lot of different countries, well, they might have a similar cause. To some extent, that's true. But it might just be pure contagion. So there's a literature in financial economics that looks at equity prices. And this is pretty well established. This is not controversial. But when prices fall, there's much more cross-border contagion than when they rise. That suggests to me some element of this is just psychology. It's easier to panic people than it is to get them elated. Uh, so maybe that's just another part of this perfect storm hitting the world today. Some bad things in different countries, people in other countries get spooked by them. I mean, look at Australia. They're growing at more than 3%. Their unemployment's a tiny bit over 5%. And they have a kind of right-wing populist movement that's really pretty strong. And the ability to stand up and say, hey, this is Australia. The sun shines every day. Our economy's still pretty great. It doesn't seem to matter that much. And that, I suspect, has to do with the psychological contagion. So on one side of the, you know, the struggle, there's all these forces, the perfect storm. On the other side for the world is the growing health and wealth and general progress. I so, so, so dearly hope those forces of general progress are stronger. But these days, I actually really don't know. My time is up. I know there's no time for questions, but I do have an email address. Google my name, email. You'll get to it. It's on my blog. So if you do want to ask me a question or contact me in any way, please just use information space and drop me a line. Thank you all. We are to introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Jeffrey Winters. I'm a professor of politics at Northwestern University, and I direct something called the Equality, Development, and Globalization Studies Program um, there. Um, I want to begin by saying that I think it's mistaken to think that rising inequality doesn't matter. You have to not be listening to the campaigns and to the voters um, and to the crowds just over the last year in the United States to reach that conclusion. The anger people uh, feel is real. Um, and when people feel dislocated, they look for who or what is to blame. And leaders help frame that blame. And they are not blaming neighbors or their sister's husband. Um, so we need to pay very close attention to the way that inequality and the perception of inequality and its reality are playing out, not just in American politics, but more globally. In the 2011 piece I wrote for the American interest, I argued that rather than ask whether the United States was an oligarchy or a democracy, which is the typical way the issue is discussed, um, that we should recognize that it is both. Democracy refers to the dispersion of political power via free participation. Universal suffrage and the principle of one person, one vote are rooted in notions of equality among citizens. Oligarchy refers to a very different kind of political influence based on extreme wealth concentrated in the hands of a few and the use of that wealth as a power resource to shape the political process. This power resource is obviously distributed very unevenly in society. In my book entitled Oligarchy and in my article for the American Interest, I demonstrated that one of the main objectives of oligarchic power is wealth defense. As we observe many social and political tensions and a deep sense of restlessness in the United States today, it is important to think about the interplay between oligarchy and democracy in the United States. Toward the end of my remarks this afternoon, I will come back to these tensions. But at this point, 
Let me just emphasize that this combination of democracy and oligarchy, of participation power and wealth power, represents an uneasy blend of great equality and great inequality. Some of my more recent work focuses on the problems inherent in trying to blend equality in one sphere with extreme inequalities in other spheres. The reality is that we don't just live in democracies, we live everywhere in stratified democracies. And wealth is clearly not the only basis of stratification that exists. Democracies have been marred by racial, ethnic, gendered, and geographic exclusions and dominations as well. As we well know from history, every democracy was born into societies that manifested all kinds of inequalities of power, privilege, access, wealth, and opportunity. The promise of democracy was that through freedom and participation, our worst inequalities would be addressed and overcome. Not only has this process been slow and uneven, but in the case of wealth stratification, nearly all democratic societies, the United States included, has become dramatically more unequal. Something is very wrong with a political system that embodies values of equality, justice, fairness, inclusion, and human dignity, and yet it tends to absorb and reflect our many stratifications and social pathologies rather than overcome them, and in some cases allows them to grow worse. I say this not as a rejection or an indictment of democracy, but rather to provoke us to confront the ways in which its promises are going unfulfilled. Failing to address these shortcomings and contradictions is a dangerous path for any nation, the United States included. I referred a moment ago to a restlessness in our democracy, and I would suggest that it is a, rest a restlessness that is reverberating in many parts of the world. If you step back a moment and look at a fairly broad sweep of history, and by that I mean several centuries, it is undeniable, on the one hand, that there is a long arc toward freedom. More people have rights, can participate, can speak out, and can vote. Democracy began in just a few countries, and even within those, large portions of their societies were excluded, sometimes as slaves or on the basis of gender and so on. Change hasn't always been fast enough or deep enough, but the trend is clear that democracy and freedom are definitely spreading. If we just take Freedom House's tally of countries that are free versus not free, the percentage of not free countries in the world has dropped from 45% in the 1970s to just 25% today. And yet, as I will mention in much greater detail in a moment, over that same arc of history, wealth has become dramatically more concentrated in few hands. This is actually profoundly puzzling, and it provokes a question. Why hasn't power to the people resulted in policies that spread more benefits to people as well? Or to put the question slightly differently, why has democracy failed to deconcentrate wealth as a matter of democratic policy or outcome. What we get instead is more wealth inequality despite more freedom and democracy. It makes sense to us that under a dictatorship, wealth should become dramatically more concentrated as the powerful grab everything for themselves and leave the crumbs for everyone else. Why doesn't freedom help us spread wealth? Not necessarily to some sort of absolute equality, but at least an improvement. And how do we make sense of things getting actually worse? To take just the United States, wealth is vastly more concentrated in a few hands today than at the nation's founding. Of course, it must be noted that part of the population was a form of capital and wealth owned by another part of the population at that time. But wealth concentration globally or in the US has actually never been remotely close in, in history to what it is now. So how bad is it? Well, just six years ago, the richest 388 people on the planet had as much wealth as the bottom half of the entire world's population combined. Today, just 62 people 
have as much wealth as the bottom 3.7 billion people on Earth. This tells us not only that wealth is concentrated, but that it is actually accelerating rapidly. Well, you might say there's a lot of dirt poor people living in villages around the world with almost nothing to their name. So you count up a lot of incredibly impoverished people and it doesn't amount to a whole lot. That's true. But let's turn to the United States, which doesn't have a lot of dirt poor villages. It takes just 20 wealthy Americans to equal the total wealth of the bottom half of the United States population, which is 152 million people. At the global level, the top 1% now owns half of all net wealth. In the US, the figure is only slightly better. The top 1% owns 40% of all net wealth. It should be noted also that both in the US and around the globe, the bottom 15% of the population actually has negative wealth. Of course, negative wealth means that their total debts are greater than their total assets. Now, I know I'm throwing out a bunch of statistics, but bear with me because these figures are incredibly important, actually, I believe, for understanding at least part of the politics we are seeing today. I'm painting a picture of growing political equality on one side of the ledger, combined with growing inequality, in this case of wealth, on the other. When we think about wealth stratification, we often think about the gap between the 1% and the 99%. But this actually misses the picture of how stratified and concentrated wealth actually is in the world and in the United States today. Let me illustrate. Um, if the bottom 99% was represented by a pyramid that was just one foot tall, bottom 99%, it would take a spire on top of that one foot pyramid that is 90 feet tall to capture just the stratification within the top 1%. That is um, the greatest and most binding, uh, that is to say that the greatest and most mind boggling stratification actually exists within the top 1% itself. Let me offer you one more comparison to put some of this in historical perspective so that we can really assess where we are in the history of human civilization. And I'm going to compare the United States to Imperial Rome. Okay, If you take the median wealth of the 500 richest Imperial Roman senators and you compare it to the average person in Imperial Rome who happened to be either a slave or a landless peasant, the ratio of wealth between those two median representatives was 10,000 to 1. Fast forward to the United States today. If you take the median wealth of the 500 richest Americans and you compare it to the median wealth of the person in the United States, it is 58,000 to 1. And if you count only liquid financial assets, it's actually 100,000 to 1. So, wealth in the democratic United States today is between six and ten times more unequally distributed than in Imperial Rome, an authoritarian system based on slavery. Well, if the story ended there, we might just say, oh, how lucky for those at the top and just be done with it. But it doesn't end there. Recall that concentrated wealth is a power resource and tremendous Inequality there introduces tremendous inequality into democracy itself. Wealth power doesn't equal political power by a simple one-to-one -one formula. There are other variables that matter. Two in particular stand out. The first is the form that wealth takes. Wealth in the form of land or cattle or mines is hard to use politically because it's not very liquid. And throughout history, a lot of wealth was held in that form, not very liquid uh, form. So some forms of wealth are more easily converted into, into political influence um, than others. But the most potent form of wealth is liquid financial assets, especially cash money. And I'll come back to this in a moment.
The second variable is what might be called the permeability of the political system to the use of wealth power. So, how easy do we make it to use wealth to influence politics? It is obvious that wealth can never be fully stripped of its power component. But we can, as a society, make it a lot harder or easier to deploy money for political purposes. The most obvious recent example that everyone is aware of is the pr Supreme Court's Citizens United decision, which opened the floodgates for oligarchs in the United States with wealth power to use their influence. And the American public has noticed, and they're not very happy about it. Now here I want to revisit the question of wealth concentration because now that I've focused it in on the question of liquid financial assets, whereas a moment ago I was talking about overall wealth concentration in all of its forms. But if we focus on financial liquid wealth, it turns out that it happens to be the most potent form for political purposes, and it happens to be the most unevenly distributed form of wealth mentioned. I'm going to present some global data, but the U.S. actually follows um, a similar pattern. So a moment ago, I made this comparison between Rome and the United States, and I said it was 58,000 to 1 in the United States if you included all property, but it became 100,000 to 1 if you only used liquid financial resources. And that's because a huge component for the average citizen in their wealth component is their home. Okay. Um, but as you get richer, financial assets loom much larger in scale and, of course, compared to the value of one's home or homes. Um, the political salience of this is that while our society might decide um, uh, to use their wealth to shape the country, uh, while some in our society might decide to use their wealth to shape the country's agenda and elevate candidates to office, very few of us can use the net worth net worth of our homes to have a political influence. Lots of people take out home equity loans for all sorts of things, but rarely do they do it to make campaign contributions, for example. And so the concentration of financial wealth is the best indicator of how wealth power, that is oligarchic power, is distributed around the world and in the US. So what do we know? These numbers are inexact because nearly all governments around the world track income, not wealth. And that's, by the way, not an accident. Um, and a lot of wealth is hidden in offshore secrecy jurisdictions. But in 2012, the world had roughly $55 trillion in total liquid financial assets. And there were about 7 billion people at that time. The top 1% owns more than 90% of all liquid financial assets globally. The bottom 99% owns less than 10%. Um, now notice, this is a far more skewed number um, than the overall wealth concentration. So recall that for the world, 1% owned 50%, and now in liquid financial assets, 1% owns over 90%. Financial firepower is almost twice as concentrated as the already extreme wealth distribution. So not only uh, do oligarchs use their wealth power to influence politics directly, but they also fund an extensive multi-billion dollar wealth defense industry made up of armies of professional accountants, lawyers, lobbyists, and other wealth management specialists whose sole job is to move money around the world, create shell corporations, hide ownership of assets, design tax shelters and tax instruments, and provide other services, all to avoid paying taxes to the government. This shifts burdens downward to others in society who are less able to pay and less able to avoid paying. It fuels resentment of government because everyone knows this is going on. And it fuels inequality in society because redistribution is thwarted which is the purpose of the wealth defense industry in the first place. Now I'm going to close my remarks by trying to link some of this to the politics of what's going on today. I mentioned earlier that we are in a moment of considerable tension and restlessness in American politics. Much of the anger we are witnessing is linked to the failed promises of democracy 
and instead of more equality in the political realm, producing more equality in other dimensions of society, we are seeing either stagnation or regression. Democracies like the United States arise, as we said before, in contexts of tremendous inequalities, but they are supposed to move us forward. That's an expectation. On racial grounds, this has not been happening. The best we can say is that race continues, race exclusion continues. Some would say things have gotten worse rather than better. But the picture on wealth stratification is actually much clearer. There has been regression and deterioration. The distribution of wealth has become more unequal, more extreme, and more concentrated. And this has spilled over into unequal political power and distortion that has made people angry. There is much that divides the Trump base and the Sanders base. But where they overlap is in their anger toward the status quo, the bleak jobs prospects, the role they feel that major corporations, financial institutions, and trade deals have had on their lives. And both bases believe their parties are thoroughly bought and paid for and are thus unrepresentative. The way in which their bases differ, Trump and Sanders, is that whereas the Sanders supporters view these problems mainly through a lens of domination and corruption roughly emanating from Wall Street, the Trump base has a very ugly race element mixed into it. This is because in addition to the wealth concentration problem just mentioned, the U.S. is also going through a demographic transformation that no European or European offshoot country has ever experienced. The country is on the verge of becoming, as Tyler mentioned before, minority white. Last September, September 2015, for the first time in the country's history, the entering kindergarten class across the United States was 49% Caucasian and 51% other races. In 20 years, the country itself will be 49% Caucasian, um, and race tensions run, as we well know, through American history. And the Trump campaign is tapping into this new anxiety in his base, which, truth be told, has always seen the country as white plus. As they face growing economic pressures, they are interpreting these pressures increasingly through a racialized lens, and he is helping them do that. This explains all the coded language, the blame and anger toward immigrants, a desire to build a wall, to deport millions of people, and in effect, to buy time on the demographic clock. So let me finish by noting that in an era that will test the promise of democracy to deliver not just formal political equality, but greater rather than less equality in other aspects of our society as well, um, this is the challenge of the time, and we ignore these challenges at our own peril. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Nils Gilman. I'm a historian. I work at UC Berkeley. Um, and I'm going to start right from the same place where Jeffrey uh, uh, ended. Um, and maybe I can begin by asking, why are we ob observing and maybe revisiting this question of plutocracy, which the American interest raised five years ago today? I think the obvious answer uh, has to do with the 2008-2009 financial collapse um, uh, here in the United States and worldwide. Two things have been critical about that financial collapse. First is that it's been a catastrophe for a very specific segment of the population. Not for everybody. Uh, for highly educated people, uh, you know, maybe your wealth went down a little bit. Your 401k maybe dropped. You know, the size of your Fidelity account dropped. But basically, mostly you held on to your job, and things have continued uh, to be pretty OK in terms of the growth prospects and your employability inside the economy. However, for the less educated, less mobile, and less flexible portion of the population, it's been an utter catastrophe. Um, the level of social destruction that's taken place uh, throughout the United States, and I should say also in other parts of the industrial core, is really hard to overstate. Whole communities, 
uh, particularly in small towns and rural areas of the Midwest, are experiencing wholesale economic and social collapse. As documented, for example, in Sam Kenonidis' uh, brilliant book, which I recommend to everybody, um, Dreamland. For traditional uh, uh, working classes, as they used to be known, jobs are gone, and the wellsprings of traditional forms of social esteem um, uh, have been uh, replaced with a blighted landscape of deindustrialization, drug abuse, and disdain on the part of elites. Now, of course, African Americans have been experiencing this kind of thing for 50 years, or arguably for hundreds of years, but this is something that is new for the lower middle class, uh, lower class and lower middle class white population. And this time, they don't even have uh, the consolation prize of a officially elite sanctioned ethno-racial supremacism. The second thing that's really important about the 2008-2009 financial collapse is that nobody was held accountable. Well, individual homeowners who borrowed more than they could afford were held accountable, but virtually none of the financial or political elites who engineered the system that collapsed in 2008 have been held to systematic account. This lack of accountability represents a moral crisis for the country that's now manifesting itself as a crisis of political le legitimacy for elites of all sorts, especially for the political elites who have overseen the development of this system over the last 40 years or so. And I'll get back to that 40 years or so in a moment. As Frank Fukuyama wrote five years ago uh, in this uh, issue of the American Interest, quote, the collapse undermined the fundamental moral justification for material inequality in a politically egalitarian society. Basic to the legitimacy of market capitalism is the efficient market hypothesis. That is, the notion that in a truly competitive market, everyone earns something close to his or her social rate of return. Now, to be fair, the, this problem with the official, uh, efficient market hypothesis is not exactly new. Uh, it was 30 years ago that Larry Summers uh, provided uh, his famously parsimonious refutation of the efficient market hypothesis. He said, there are idiots, look around. Never mind the irony that despite uh, rejecting the efficient market hypothesis, Summers is as responsible as anybody else um, for the entrenching of the United States' current system of financialized capitalism. Nonetheless, as Fukuyama continued, the crisis made it glaringly obvious that the efficient market hypothesis was wrong. Oversized returns were flowing to innovative financial entrepreneurs who, in their avidity to create new and more complex financial instruments and products, were destroying rather than creating value for society as a whole. The crisis also shed light on the fact that corporate America was doing very well for its officers and shareholders, many of whom were not American citizens, but much less well for Americans awaiting the trickle of jobs um, as, as, as the, uh, the trickle of jobs as they were outsourced and automated by the millions. So perhaps corporate America's social rate of return um, approximated the expectations of the efficient market hypothesis, but only if the, uh, only if the social no longer was in reference to the United States' society alone. So this was the general context in which two years ago I published my article uh, about Leviathan Mugged. Um, and what I, the argument I made in that piece was, uh, was uh, quite simple, actually. I argued that um, the uh, global political economy, and the United States in particular, faces what I called a twin insurgency, one from below and the other from above. Um, on the one hand, from below, there's an interconnected set of criminal insurgencies in which the global disenfranchised resist, co-opt, root around states as they seek ways to empower and enrich themselves in the shadows of the global economy. Drug cartels, human traffickers, computer hackers, counterfeiters, arms dealers, and others exploit the failures of governance um, systems to build global commercial empires for themselves that in turn provide them with the resources to corrupt, co-opt, and challenge incumbent political actors. So that's the criminal insurgency from below. On the other hand, from above, there exists what I called a plutocratic insurgency, in which globalized elites seek to disengage from traditional national obligations and responsibilities. These people include the wealth protecting classes that Jeffrey was referring to earlier, libertarian activists, tax haven lawyers, currency speculators, mineral extraction magnates, um, the, the new global super rich, um, the super class as, uh, as they've been called, and their hired help, who are waging a broad based campaign um, that aims either to limit the reach or the capacity of government tax collectors and regulators or to manipulate these functions as a tool in their own cutthroat, cutthroat business competition. 
Now, obviously, there was a bit of a provocation here in referring to these, first of all, in posing a kind of equivalency, although I'll try to defend that in a moment, between the plutocratic insurgency and the criminal insurgency. But also, there's a provocation in calling these people insurgents. What do I mean by insurgents? Well, the first thing I want to say is these are not traditional kinds of what we would think of as stereotypical 20th century revolutionary actors. The stereotypical 20th century revolutionary actor, someone I'm thinking of like Lenin or like Mao or like the Ayatollah Khomeini, are people who seek to capture the state because they have a social project that they wish to enact. Those social projects have varied, obviously, from one revolutionary actor to another. But generally speaking, that was the model, and that was the number one thing that U.S. foreign policy, in many ways, during the course of the 20th century, was geared at stopping. We wanted to stop the Nazis. We wanted to stop the communists. We wanted to stop extremist forms of Islam from taking over states and enacting social projects that were anathema to the kinds of values that the United States believed in. That's not the kind of actors we're talking about here. They don't actually have a social project. They're not interested in capturing the state in order to institute a certain kind of social reform. Rather, what they're interested in doing is crippling the state. This is why it's about Leviathan being mugged. It's not about taking Leviathan and teaching Leviathan how to do something different. It's about trying to just limit the scope and range of Leviathan. I think these things are at the heart of what we've seen in the populist revolts that have broken out on both sides of the Atlantic over the last year or so. And I think this is especially true for the case of both Brexit and Trump, or at least the Trump phenomenon. What do I mean by that? If you think about what the thing is that has motivated people to vote for Brexit, or that's motivating people to support Trump, it's really a reaction to both ends of this twin insurgency. On the one hand, there's a reaction to the plutocratic insurgents who are fundamentally seeking to undermine the state. This is why both in Britain and in the United States, the leaders of Brexit and Trump himself are interested in defending social, uh, social security and national health service and other kinds of social institutions. These are people who specifically identify the plutocrats as part of the problem that's undermining the basis of security for the white natives in these societies. These, both of these movements are also naming or at least pointing to the criminal insurgency, which they identify with illicit actors from abroad. In many cases, those are the actors who are bringing in the criminal insurgencies into their societies, bringing in drug dealing, bringing in human trafficking, bringing in people who are fundamentally changing the characters of the societies that they're part of. Now, I myself don't necessarily support the kinds of solutions that are being proposed through Brexit or with Trump, but it is true that these organizations uh, and that these movements are pointing out real problems that the mainstream politicians have mostly just tried to ignore or say were described as birthing pains or as transaction costs on our way to a globalized future that w w in which all boats would be raised. Many people have become extremely skeptical of that. If you look at the pattern of how wealth has been distributed, the, 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 the benefits of economic growth over the last generation have been distributed, it's extremely uneven. Basically, you have Two, you have a, a bimodal distribution. On the one hand, we know the story about the 1%. This has been made famous by Thomas Piketty's work. The 1% globally and in most nations have done extremely well over the last 40 years. Financialized capitalism and technology have provided ways for people to make, at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the economic food chain, money at a scale that's never been seen before in all the ways uh, that Jeffrey was describing earlier. The, the second part of the bimodal distribution is the bottom half of the global income distribution. Despite the fact that inequality is growing, there's been a great deal of poverty reduction globally all over the world. Now, a big part of this story, the majority of this story, is the China story. The most astounding thing that's happened in economic history, possibly in history full stop, is what's happened in China over the last 30 years. Almost 600 million people have moved out of, out of villages into cities and out of poverty into lower middle class types of existence. This is not to say there's not a lot of poor people left in China, but an enormous amount of poverty reduction has taken place in China. And not just in China, in many other parts of the world, in Latin America, in South Asia, there's been a great deal of growth in what we would call the uh, five to 55 uh, percentile range of global population, of the, of the global income range. There's been a great deal of wealth. The place that has really suffered, and in some cases there's been negative growth, even over a 30 year period, has been in the part of the, of the global uh, income spectrum, which is about in the 70s and 80s percentile. In other words, the working classes of the industrial north, all right? 
these people have seen a relative decline, and in some cases an absolute decline, in their level of wealth and in their level of income. And at the same time, they've seen a great deal of increase all over the, all over the, uh, in the, uh, at the upper echelon and in the, uh, in the lower echelon. So relatively speaking, there's been a massive amount of declassing for people in that particular job segment, and they don't have the kinds of flexibility and mobility options that people at the, bottom, at the top of the food chain have. That, I think, explains a great deal uh, of the anger that you've seen. And it's what, a major thing that precipitated the Brexit vote, and it's a major thing that's driving the support for Trump today. So let me step back and be a historian for a moment about this. How did we end up in this situation? I would argue that the economic system, the political, the global political economic system that we have today was really born in the 1970s, came to maturity in the 90s, and is now in its senescence. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, a somewhat obscure uh, Russian economist, Nikolai Kondratiev, uh, who uh, almost a century ago uh, described the way in which there's been this recurring set of patterns in global capitalism over the last 250 years, where new kinds of technology platforms come online um, and provide a basis for all kinds of ancillary growth over time. So, uh, for example, um, in the first Kondratiev cycle, which lasted from about 1800 to about 1850, it was steam engines, it was cotton, and it was those kinds of productive systems that provided a huge amount of growth, uh, particularly in the core of, of, uh, of northeastern United States and in Britain, Midlands, and, increase, and then in, uh, in Britain in the British Midlands. However, in the 1840s, there was a major crisis of the, of the, of the, uh, of the global economy. Uh, this is one of the things this led to was the Irish, Irish famine, because the Brits kept exporting, uh, kept exporting grain from Ireland, even as, uh, even as the potato blight uh, uh, caused, was causing millions of people to die. Um, in the United States in the 1840s, there was also a financial, several rounds of financial crisis. But eventually, at that very moment, when it seemed as if there might be uh, a, a serious uh, decline in the power of um, uh, the, the power of the steam engine to continue to generate economic growth, a second new wave of growth began really through the invention of steel and railways. And again, you had the same kind of cycle. Throughout the late 19th century, there was a major growth until about the 1870s. And then between the 1870s and 1890s, there was a period of secular stagnation that caused a lot of disruptions here and led to the, the uh, rise of the Populist Party in the United States and other similar things. At that very moment, when it seemed as if capitalism might be stalling, socialism was becoming very popular. Of course, this was exactly the moment of, uh, of uh, where Marx is beginning to uh, become a popular figure in Europe as well. Another wave begins. This time it's the electrical um, chemistry, the electrical engineering and chemistry and uh, chemical uh, industries that provide a new wave of growth. And similarly, again, there's a 25, 35-year period of growth that then begins to tail off in the, uh, in the teens um, and then is replaced by the automobile and petrochemical industry, which has a long period of growth until about the 1970s, the era of stagflation. Just when it seemed as if capitalism might not be working any longer, and now we're getting up to the period where our own time period, where our own political economy is born, a whole series of transformations take place in the 1970s. At the level of governance of the global economy, we move to floating exchange rates away from the Bretton Woods system. Um, we start moving towards a much freer trade, much greater trade liberalization that had begun earlier with GATT, but really accelerates during the 1970s. And most importantly, we start to get a new kind of platform for growth, namely information technologies. And for the last 40 years, we've ridden the wave of growth related to information technologies. What I would argue is that we're reaching, or may perhaps we have reached, the age of senescence for the growth available from information technologies. And if you think about this, what are the major things, the major breakthroughs we're seeing with information technology nowadays? Pokemon Go. This is not improving the productivity of the economy in any kind of a broad sense, right? Um, we seem to have run out of things that are really going to increase. The first wave of information technology, the computerization, led to global supply chains, much more efficient inventory management, and so on. That's all been done. All the low-hanging fruit associated with the platform of information technology has been picked. And that's one of the reasons why we're having the kind of productivity crisis that Tyler was describing earlier, is we've run out of real productivity growth. That's not to say there aren't companies that are going to spring up and create new consumer products and individual companies in Silicon Valley that are going to do very well, but they, this is no longer a amplified productivity platform that can spread wealth into, uh, into remote corners of the, uh, of the economy. 
So the question I think we have to ask is, are we going to see another Kondratiev wave emerge that can potentially pull us out of the secular stagnation that we've seen ourselves in and create new kinds of platforms for growth? I think there's some candidates out there for technology platforms that could serve that purpose. Biotechnology could be in that category. Uh, robotics could be in that category. Uh, artificial intelligence could be in that category. As with all kinds of technological innovations, it's very hard to be predictive about these things. We don't really know. Maybe these five Kondratiev waves that we've seen are the only five we're ever going to have. Maybe there won't be any more productivity gains from major technological breakthroughs. We actually just don't know. I'm optimistic that we may see such a thing. But the other thing that's happened at every turn in the Kondratiev waves is there's been an absolute kind of morphing event in the structure of the governing institutions in the economies that were really able to most effectively take advantage of the new technologies that came along. And what I'm concerned about is this other point that Tyler was making when he was referring to the, as the Mancor Olson problem, which is that we've reached a kind of sclerosis in our political institutions to the point where we can't even reform the institutions themselves. And if we're really going to be able to take maximum advantage of the technology platforms that could emerge in the next 10 or 20 years to reignite productivity growth in the global economy, we're going to have to figure out ways to reform our institutions to, so that they can flexibly take advantage of these things. Currently, there's too many blocking factions, too many veto points in, the, uh, in, in our governing institutions to really make this effective. And the question is, how are we going to overcome that? I don't think Trump is the answer, and I'm not sure Hillary is either. But I also think that this is the last cycle in which we're going to see this particular formation of political act actors, and that we're very likely to see a very different kind of uh, axis of uh, political debate emerge. And this is where Trump does point forward, perhaps. There will be those who want to reform our institutions in ways that will allow us to take advantage of incipient new technology platforms, and there will be those who just want to defend the status quo and try to hang on to legacy privileges. And I believe that that political division, which doesn't necessarily map perfectly onto the divisions we're currently seeing today, will be the salient one, and the question of which of one of those factions wins will determine whether the United States can continue to play a leading role in the world. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is quite extraordinary. We're actually uh, ahead of schedule. I don't think I have ever experienced such an experience, pardon me, I'm tired, uh, at any think tank event that I've ever been to, and certainly not anything that I've ever put on. Uh, <laughs> nothing else, nothing American interest has, uh, has ever done. Um, so, uh, what I think we'll do uh, is break now. When we say networking intermission, we're trying to be original. Uh, so you can interpret that uh, however you wish. And we will reconvene at 3.30, but really 3.30 sharp, because we will not have Frank Fukuyama physically here. We will be beaming him in live from Palo Alto, hopefully in high definition, because we FedExed a special camera to him. And we'll start that right at 3.30. Thank you very much. And also, at the end of the afternoon, there's a reception. I hope you'll join us for that.